Okay. Uh, so I'm really excited to kick off this semester, um, and I'd like to thank the organizers again for putting this all together. Uh, I think it should be a really great um, several months here, uh, really productive and enjoyable. Um, so I'm going to introduce Interactive Proust, um, and I'll start just with an outline of how the next two hours will go. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Interactive Proust, some of the um, technical terms in this outline won't make sense, but I did want to give just a sense of what you're going to see uh, rather than just diving into it. So I'll obviously start with the definition and motivation for interactive proofs. Um, and interactive proofs divides, uh, derive their power from the combination of randomness and interaction. So what I'll actually start by talking about is not interactive proofs. I'll just give a couple of stark um, demonstrations of the power of randomness on its own. Um, and this section of the talk will also introduce some of the technical ideas that will be useful when we actually see uh, very efficient and powerful interactive proofs. Uh, then I'll introduce some important technical concepts uh, for the design of efficient interactive proofs, uh, namely notions called low degree extensions and arithmetization. And then we'll see what's really the key hammer, like the one hammer you really need to know to design efficient interactive proofs, which is called the sum check protocol. Um, and then we'll apply the sum check protocol uh, to a certain problem called sharp set. And then we'll see a notion called doubly efficient interactive proofs, uh, which is actually the notion that's most relevant to this program. Okay, so just so you know roughly what the topics will be, even if they don't all make sense at this point. All right, so when you think about interactive proofs, um, I think it's helpful to have the following scenario in mind. It's just one application scenario, but it makes things very concrete. So imagine there is a um, computationally weak user, uh, maybe it's you with your laptop, who is using a commercial cloud computing service to store and process its data. OK, so you send a bunch of data up to the cloud who stores the data, and you might also store the data or maybe just some kind of summary of the data. And then later you ask the, qu uh, the cloud a question about your data, which might be of the form, you know, hey, cloud, please run this analysis on my data. And the cloud responds with the answer. Uh, but you don't trust the cloud. So you would really like a guarantee that the answer is correct. You're not just going to blindly trust the cloud. So you start interrogating the cloud, sending a sequence of challenges, and receiving a sequence of responses. And at the end of this interaction with the cloud, you have to decide whether to accept the answer as valid or reject it as invalid. Okay. Now, in general, these challenges will be randomized. That ensures that the cloud cannot predict in advance what the next challenge will be. So a little more formally, um, in any interactive proof, there are two parties, a prover, uh, which throughout this talk I'll denote with a red P, and a verifier, which will be noted with a, a blue V. Uh, so in the previous scenario, the cloud is acting like the prover, and you are acting like the verifier, or your laptop is. So in an interactive proof, the prover solves a problem and tells the verifier the answer, and then they have a conversation during which the prover tries to convince the verifier that the answer is correct. Okay, so any interactive proof has to satisfy two requirements. So the first is called completeness, which roughly says that an honest prover who follows the protocol perfectly will convince the verifier to accept the answer as valid. Right, so sometimes we require this to hold just with very high probability, but every interactive proof you'll see today, this will actually hold always. So an honest prover will always, with probability one, convince the verifier to accept. Um, so soundness, uh, the other property, roughly says that if the prover lies and uh, returns an invalid answer, then the verifier will reject with high probability. Okay, so this has to hold even if the prover is computationally unbounded and trying to trick the verifier into accepting the incorrect answer even though it's not correct. So this is the definition of interactive proofs. Are there any questions about this? This is the most important slide of the next two hours. <laughs> Okay, so if the prover um, returns an incorrect answer, um, we refer to like the, the maximum probability with which the prover can convince the verifier to accept as the soundness error of the protocol. So we want the soundness error to be as low as possible, very close to zero ideally. Okay, so let's forget about interactive proofs um, for a little bit. And oh, sorry. Yep. Can I ask high probability with respect to what parameter? Yeah, so. Um, the way this was originally formalized, I think, um, we, people will often just say any uh, constant probability, even like a third, but that's not useful in practice when you're using these in uh, cryptographic applications. 
So just think probability 2 to the minus 120, something like that, cryptographically low. Um, in all of the protocols we'll, we'll see today, you can always drive the soundness error as low as you want, um, possibly with just some additional constant factor overheads in the calls. But constant, no, there's no scaling. Um, you can drive it to formerly negligible um, in the input size if you want. Yeah, so you can, you can formulate um, negligible soundness error the same way cryptographers do. Um, it's a bit of a that technicality that won't be important for understanding the talk. So if you have some sort of security parameter, you can make it run it. So you can always repeat any protocol like logarithmically many times in the security parameter and it's um, the number of times you repeat it, the soundness error is going to fall exponentially quickly with that. So do we have a guidance of the exact value of the probability of different, uh, for different applications? Um, this, so it, it'll depend on how much security you want in your application. Uh, I mean, typically with, and then, so people often draw a distinction between, uh, okay, let me take a step back real quickly. So the, tomorrow you're going to hear about argument systems, which uh, are the same thing except soundness is only required to hold against computationally bounded provers. Okay. Um, and people draw a distinction between um, like computational error and statistical error. This is all statistical. Um, so I don't know if you would like the, the chance that the prover convinces the verifier to accept an incorrect answer, you know, with probability two to the minus 80, we can achieve that. And that means like in the entire age of the universe, even if you let the prover try over and over again, he's not going to succeed. And you're probably not going to let the prover try more than once, I would okay. think. Questions? Okay, so in general, we're just for this talk, we're just we're going to want this to be low, and it's going to be easy to make it as low as we want. Okay, so let's forget about interactive proofs for a little bit and just talk about the power of randomness. Um, so I want to start with a very stark demonstration of the power of randomness in the context of um, a problem called the communication complexity of equality. All right, so in this problem, there are two parties, Alice and Bob. And let's imagine Alice and Bob is geographically separated. Maybe they live across the country from each other. And Alice has an n-bit string uh, that we'll call A, and Bob has an n-bit string that we'll call B. And the goal is just to determine, do they have the same string? Okay. Um, and they want to determine this while exchanging as few bits as possible. Okay. So all we care about is the number of bits they send back and forth to each other. That's the communication complexity of equality. Now, there's a trivial solution to this problem, which is Alice can just send her whole bit string to Bob. And Bob can just check, does Alice's bit string that she just sent me equal my bit string? And I'll put yes if so and no if not. Now, what is the cost of this solution? Uh, well, it's, um, it's n bits, because Alice is sending all n of her bits to Bob. So that's not very interesting, but it turns out for deterministic protocols, this is the best you can do. So where things get interesting is if you allow the protocol to be randomized, and have some small probability, very small, of outputting the wrong answer. So here's a randomized solution. Uh, so first, a little bit of notation. All right, so I'm going to let f actually throughout this talk be uh, a finite field of size at least about n squared. If you've never seen what a, a field is before, it's just a set equipped with addition, multiplication, division, and subtraction operations. And if you're familiar with the integers modulo p for a prime p, that's always a, a finite field. So you can think of f as just all of the integers modulo some prime p, as long as p is bigger than about n squared. And what Alice and Bob are going to do is they're going to interpret their bits as elements of the field. So you know, 0 is an element of any field, and 1 is an element of any field. So they're interpreting their bits as field elements. And then Alice is going to interpret her input as just the coefficients of a polynomial, which I'm going to call p. So p is a polynomial over this field. And Bob interprets his input as a polynomial Q over the field. Right. And all they do is the following. Alice picks a random field element and sends the field element and the evaluation of P at that input to Bob. And then Bob just checks, does his polynomial agree with Alice's polynomial at that one point? And if so, he's convinced that they're actually equal inputs. And if not, he says, no, these are, these are not equal inputs. Uh, to the two-line protocol. <clears throat> Alice is the prover and Bob. There's no prover. We've forgotten about interactive proofs for the next like five minutes. Yeah, no prover. Uh, there's just Alice and Bob who want to know are their two vectors equal. 
Uh, okay, that's the whole protocol. Does it make sense? So Alice and Bob are just interpreting their inputs as the coefficients of two polynomials and seeing do the two polynomials agree at a random input. Yep. So here we're not worried about them being malicious? No, no. No interactive proofs. Every, it's just Alice and Bob uh, talking to each other, and they're, they're cooperating to figure out are their inputs the same. And so this is just an example of sort of power of randomization. Yes, yes. Of and the techniques we're using here with polynomials will be later uh, useful later. More questions? And this technique is uh, optimal? Uh, it is. Um, yes, it will be op optimal. Um, to get the failure probability that they're going to achieve with this, it is. Will we be factoring the computation cost as well? Since no, so, for this, so this is computationally very light. But as far as communication complexity goes, we only care about the bits exchange. Uh, but um, yeah, Alice and Bob in this protocol are, are running in time linear in the size of their inputs because, I mean, evaluating this polynomial at a random input is time order n. So they can't really do better than that since they have to read their inputs, even if we did care. So, so x to i is shared common to both, right? Um, so, so this is just a definition of the polynomial. X is an indeterminate here. Uh, where the, the input they evaluate their polynomials at is R, which is a field element that Alice chooses at random. And Bob knows what R is because Alice is going to tell him what R is. So this round costs you log n bits. Correct. And that's the next bullet point on, on my slides. So uh, given that there, maybe I'm thinking too much about the TV, but given that there's only like n squared or so values of mm -hmm. R, it doesn't uh, oh, I guess because by the time you try to n squared, you might as well send the, the bit strings to the bar. Right. Yeah, let's, um, the, I'll analyze the costs of this protocol shortly, so maybe ask your... I guess my, my question is, it seems like you drive it down to zero. Or... The bigger the field is, the lower the chance they output the wrong answer in this protocol. Um, so, and this is kind of what I was saying before, is if we want to drive the failure probability as close to zero as we want, we just go, are going to have to work over bigger fields. OK, so this is the protocol. And actually, um, the analysis of the protocol has kind of come up in, in questions now. But let me go through it real quickly. So firstly, what, what is the cost of this? How many bits does Alice send to Bob? Well, she only sends two field elements to Bob, r and p of r. And the, the field has size n squared. So specifying each one of these field elements is about two log n bits. So the total communication cost is just order log n. Does that make sense? That's how many bits it takes to write down two field elements if the field has size and square. Okay. I want to give um, this value p of r that Alice sends to Bob a name because it's going to come up several times throughout this talk. So I'm going to call it the Reed Solomon fingerprint of the vector a at r. Right. This is referring to a notion from coding theory. Uh, p of r is actually the evaluation of something called the Reed Solomon code. It's a random entry of that encoding of, of Alice's vector A. But that's really just to give some name to the value P of R. OK, so uh, let's talk about the correctness of this protocol. That is, what is the probability that Alice and Bob output the wrong answer? So the correctness of this protocol is captured in two claims. Uh, the first is, is if Alice's input actually equals Bob's input, so their two vectors are equal, then Bob will always output equal in this protocol. Right. And the second claim is that if Alice and Bob's inputs are not equal, they're not the same vector, then Bob will output not equal with probability at least 1 minus 1 over n, where that probability is over the random choice of the field element r. Okay. So essentially, in, in both cases, they almost always output the right answer. In the first case, they actually always output the right answer. Okay. So the first claim should be obvious. If, if their two input vectors are equal, then P and Q are just the same polynomial. So they agree at every point, in particular, whatever point Alice picks. To compare them at, they're going to agree at that point. So the interesting case is when A does not equal B. All right, so let's quickly run through the, the proof of this claim um, for this case. So the key fact that guarantees a low probability of outputting the wrong answer in this case is the following. If P and Q are univariate polynomials of degree at most n, then P and Q can agree on at most n inputs. So this is just a basic fact about low-degree polynomials. 
It's actually equivalent to the statement that any degree n polynomial has at most n roots, which is something that is often taught, I think, in middle school even. So a reformulation of this statement is that the probability over the random choice of R that Alice picks, that P and Q agree at that input, if they're not actually the same polynomial, is at most n over the field size. So we chose the field size to be n squared just to ensure that this failure probability is at most 1 over n. If we chose the field size to be even bigger than n squared, the failure probability goes even smaller. Any questions about that? So this had nothing to do with interactive proofs. There was no prover. Alice and Bob trusted each other. But there were some um, interesting technical takeaways uh, from this protocol. So the first technical takeaway is that any two low-degree polynomials, which are not the same polynomial, disagree at almost all inputs. Okay, that was this fact that we saw on the previous slide. Um, and there's an important corollary of this, which is that if um, in an interactive proof, if a verifier were to evaluate two polynomials at the same point, a randomly chosen point that only the verifier you know, chose herself, and the two polynomials agreed at that randomly chosen point, then it's somehow safe for the verifier to believe they're actually the same polynomial. Okay. Because for that check to pass, and for them not to be the same polynomial, the verifier would have to get very unlucky and pick one of the very small number of points at which the two polynomials did agree at. What do you mean by low degree here? Uh, yeah, so um, in general, the probability that two distinct degree n polynomials agree um, at a randomly chosen input is at most their degree over the field size. So we just want this probability to be small. Um, so for, that, for it to be small, the degree has to be significantly smaller than the field size. That's all I mean. Low degree means much smaller than the field size. More questions? No, no. Just for this example, if uh, they were to, to take uh, a random point, mm -hmm. a random index, mm -hmm. and just sum and send the sum, and then uh, you, you won't get the same complexity. Uh, what do you mean a random index and sum? I take a random index mm -hmm. and I sum all the bits between zero and the index. Oh, I see. And I send it and the compare it. This. Yeah. So the same, or the same for this example? Um, I don't think, so imagine that the two vectors disagree in just one point. You, for that solution to work, I suppose you'd have to make sure that that point is in the, inde uh, is in the range you're talking about, and maybe in that range they have to di actually disagree in two points and they cancel out. So that, that solution would require more care. I think it works for what we can say. Okay, we, we can take more. <laughs> So, so this is a worst case analysis in some ways. The uh, original polynomials had no reason, no malice uh, intention to try to look alike. Mm -hmm. Then the chances that they even agree on n minus one of the endpoints is, is pretty small. I mean, that's the worst case, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if they if if you were like promised that their two inputs disagree at like a constant fraction of their locations, they could just like check a randomly chosen location or something. But um, yeah, so this is a worst case analysis. Of course, we're, that's what we'll be interested in. Um, interactive proofs are a malicious setting, so we really want worst case guarantees there. And are people looking at average case? Um, people do. It's not a topic for uh, this talk, anyway. How do you know Alice choose a low degree polynomial? So in, in this part of the talk, we're, Alice and Bob are both trusted. Okay, so they're just going to follow the protocol we tell them to follow. So we're just telling Alice, look, interpret your n bits as the coefficients of a degree n polynomial, and Alice is going to do it for us. Okay. okay, so the other takeaway from this protocol is that interpreting inputs as low degree polynomials is powerful. Um, so what's happening in this, um, in this equality protocol is that if Alice and Bob's inputs differ at even a single element, then once we interpret them as polynomials, those polynomials differ at almost all inputs, at almost everywhere. And that's a powerful thing. Somehow interpreting things as polynomials, at least low-degree polynomials, is like a, a different amplifying operation. So that's the reason I started with 
something that wasn't an interactive proof to display these two takeaways very cleanly, although it seems like it might have caused a little bit of confusion um, to go right from interactive proofs to we, we trust everyone. But um, we can now go back to proofs if my computer hasn't died. Um, OK, so uh, the next demonstration we'll see for the uh, power of randomness will be in the context of um, verifiable computing, interactive proofs, except it, it won't be interactive. So I'm going to give you a non-interactive protocol for the problem of verifying matrix products. OK, so in, in this problem, the input is just two n by n matrices whose entries are from a finite field. And the goal is to compute the product matrix. So the fastest known algorithm for this problem runs in time about n to the 2.37, and that's not a practical algorithm. Um, and it's a major research question, can you do any better? But we're not interested in solving this problem from scratch uh, in this talk, because we're now interested in proof systems. So the question I want to ask is, what if an untrusted prover claims that you know, uh, he or she has computed the correct answer? So the prover says, here's the answer. It's this matrix C. So the question is, can that answer be verified in time linear in the input size? So linear in the input size will be faster than any known algorithm that just solves the problem. Right. And the answer is yes, and that's what I want to tell you about now. Uh, does the problem make sense and the result I'm going to show you? OK, so here's the protocol. Um, so the verifier will pick a random field element. And it's going to let x be the vector consisting of just all of the um, powers from 1 to n of, of that field element. So r, r squared, r cubed, up to r to the n. And what the verifier is going to do is it's going to multiply the claimed answer by the vector x um, and also compute the true answer times the vector x. And I'll explain in a moment how it can do that quickly. And it's going to accept if and only if um, these, they agree. So this should be reminiscent of the equality protocol um, that we talked about previously. Um, in the equality protocol, like Alice and Bob evaluated like their two vectors at a random input um, once you interpreted them as polynomials. And we're doing something similar here by multiplying the two matrices, the claimed answer and the real answer, by kind of a randomly chosen vector. So this the, the simple version of this, which you take a random vector of 0, 1, is known as the Bloom algorithm, I think. And what, is the, what would be the difference, the, the complexity bound that you get by it? Um, so if, the, if it's a random 0, 1 vector, I'll have to think offline about if that works. But I can, so, so, probability half, uh, so, so that, that might, yeah, that might be fine. Let me, so, so, so th this protocol um, is essentially due to, to Freevolds um, from the late 70s. Although in Freevolds protocol, the vector x um, was totally random field elements. Every entry was an independent random field element. And um, for my purposes, I, uh, for specific reasons, I, I wanted to choose um, this more structured vector x. Um, this, this variant of Freevolds protocol is actually due to Kimbrell and Sinha, I think. Um, so what you're describing probably works as well. Um, but let's stick with this variant. Okay. Any other questions about the protocol itself? So it's a two-line protocol. Make sense? Um, all right, so let's talk about the runtime. So in this protocol, the verifier's runtime is, is dominated by just computing three matrix vector products. So let, let me explain. So the verifier has to multiply C by X, and the prover just is handing the verifier C. Okay, so that's just one matrix vector multiplication, right? The verifier sees C explicitly. So the, the tricky aspect is that the verifier also, ha also has to compute AB times X. But the whole point of the problem is the verifier doesn't know A times B. That's what the verifier would like to compute. But thankfully, because of associativity of matrix multiplication, AB times X is the same as A times BX. So the verifier can compute AB times X just by computing BX with one matrix vector multiplication and then multiplying that by A. That's a second matrix vector multiplication. And matrix vector multiplication can be done in time n squared. That's something you can just think about for a minute. It's like the definition of matrix vector multiplication. 
is obviously an n squared time operation. These are n by n matrices, so n squared is linear in the input size. So here, log n terms are, you're not, you don't consider them at all, or like multiplication can be done in unit cost? Yes, yeah, so throughout this talk, thank you for asking me to clarify that. I'm going to call um, addition and multiplication in a field just one, one time step, just for ease of accounting. And, and the best known verification algorithm then is n squared log n, or? Sorry, if th like this. If you, if you view it as bits, bit strings. Oh, as bits? You would need log n over um, I'd have to check that offline. But the, el it's, the elements of the field don't have length. Oh, maybe, do they have length in terms of n? Because I don't, I yeah. think it'll be okay. Well, so I, I define the problem so that the input matrix consists of arbitrary field elements. So yeah. you do have to do general field multiplications. But for this talk, we're just going to call every field operation a unit, unit step. OK, so yeah, so if we're calling field operations one time step, this is a n squared time verifier. And, and you can't do better than that in, in this without accounting, because the verifier has to at least read the input, which takes n squared steps. OK, so why is this protocol correct? Um, so its correctness is captured by the following two claims, um, which is totally analogous to the case of the communication complexity of equality. Right, so that is, if the, if the prover actually sends the, the true answer, so C equals A times B, then the verifier will always accept. And if the prover sends the wrong answer, then the verifier will reject with probability at least 1 minus 1 over N. All right, so the first claim is, is obvious. If, you, um, if C equals A times B, then when you multiply them both by X, you'll get out the same thing. So the verifier will always accept. So the interesting case, again, is claim 2. Um, so to prove this claim, recall that the, the vector x uh, that the verifier you know, multiplies c by and, and a times b by is just all powers of r up to n. And this means that the, the ith entry of c times x is, is just this. So this is like the, the dot product of the ith row of c with um, the vector x. And that's identical to the reed solomon fingerprint at r of that row of c. So th this is why I started with the equality protocol before moving to this one, um, is, is so that I could um, just invoke the analysis of the um, equality protocol um, here. Okay, so, so similarly, uh, the ith entry of AB times X is the reed solomon fingerprint of the ith row of AB. Um, so what this means is that if, if C is not exactly equal to A times B, so if they differ at even a single entry, um, then the, the row that that entry is in, um, what will be comparing, the verifier will be comparing um, the Reed Solomon fingerprint of you know, that, that row from the claimed answer, which does not equal that row of the true answer. And we've already analyzed what happens in that case. So we said if you take the Reed Solomon fingerprint of two vectors that are not the same vector, they will disagree with probability at least 1 minus 1 over n. Sorry for being tedious, but uh, r to the n, how do you compute that in linear time? r to the n? And, uh, so um, r times r times r. <laughs> but again, if, we, if you take my word that uh, this Bloom algorithm mm -hmm. in every probabilistic algorithm class, mm -hmm. it's, uh, if you take the, the, the vector 0, 1, mm -hmm. and now you, you take the multiplication complexity, mm -hmm. uh, You'll get the same the same result by repeating it uh, by repeating it log n times. Uh, correct. Um, so yeah, the, I'm not making any special claims that there are benefits of this over other variants. Um, this is using concepts that will be useful later in the talk. So there there are other variants of this, um, more than one, that will achieve the same costs and so forth. But this is a the particular way I wanted to do it. But uh, you don't know any, any way of doing it in n squared, actually, if you have bit. If you care about bit, I, I just haven't thought about it. Does the matrices have elements in the field or zero one? In the field? Well, they're zero one usually in the matrix. Then I think right. you can take the field to be constant size. No, but then the error is not going to So, like, you want a constant error. So, I think this is a great thing to think about offline. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so. Those were, uh, that was our detour you know, away from interactive proofs, but to reveal the power of randomness. And uh, by the way, this, I, I end at 10. 10? 
Um, 30. 10.30? 10.30. 10.30. And it's not? And what time is it? <coughs> Okay. All right. I'm doing good. All right. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to talk only about interactive proofs for like the rest of the 90 minutes left or whatever I have. So um, I need to start with some preliminaries, um, introducing some important technical notions. Um, so first, I'm going to start with something called the Schwarzschild lemma. Um, so this is a variant of the fact we've previously seen in this talk, which is that if P and Q are two univariate polynomials of degree at most d then the probability they agree at a randomly chosen input is at most d over the field size. So the Schwarzschild lemma is an extension of this to multivariate polynomials. Uh, it says that if p and q are distinct L-variate polynomials of total degree at most d, and I'll clarify what total degree means in a second, then the same kind of statement holds. If you evaluate them at randomly chosen input, they agree with probability at most d over the field size. So it's just generalizing from univariate to L-variate polynomials. And what I mean by total degree is just uh, take every term in the polynomial and take the one where if you add up all the powers in the term, uh, it's maximized. So the total degree of this polynomial is 3 because this term has the sum of the powers is 3. And you know, so it dominates the total degree of this term, which is just 2. Okay. So throughout this talk, we'll, we'll actually only need the univariate version, uh, but I think it's still useful to know about the Schwarzschild lemma, and I believe Prahlad's going to use it in this afternoon. Um, so the Schwarzschild lemma it, it motivates the, the next notion we're going to need, uh, which are called extension polynomials. Uh, so here's the definition. So suppose we're given a function f, which maps L bits to a field. So an L-variate polynomial g over the field um, is said to extend f if f and g agree at all of the inputs where f is defined. Okay. So f is only defined here over 0, 1 to the l, but g is defined over like field to the l. Okay. And g is said to extend f if f and g do agree wherever f is defined. So g is like somehow extending the domain of f to a much bigger set from 0, 1 to the l to f to the l. Does that make sense? So any function mapping 0, 1 to the L to F has uh, a, a unique extension, which is multilinear. Multilinear means that the polynomial has degree at most 1 in each variable. Okay, so for example, this is a multilinear polynomial um, because the degree is at most 1 in each variable. And this is not um, because this term has degree 2 in, in x1. This is a real, okay, yeah. Unique, uh, independent of the number of variables or? Unique. So, L so, so, so f is defined over L variables. L is fixed. F is just like a fixed function. So for any function defined over domain 0, 1 to the L, there's a unique multilinear polynomial that extends f. This is a really important technical notion, so please ask more questions. Um, so sorry, I haven't seen this. So is the intuition something like when you have the degree at most one thing, it's like a dimension two to the n type of thing, and then you already have like that many dimensions with the original smaller quantity? Is that a good way? Um, well, I'm not, so actually, may, the next slide has a picture. So maybe um, let's let's see the picture and then ask your question again. But this is yeah, not true. If you take a multilinear mm -hmm. and uh, you look what is, it, there always exists a, a, a unique zero one that will map to it that will give you the f tilde for it? Correct. So it's one to one uh, correspondence? Yes. Yes. But we will only need the one direction of that correspondence uh, in going from functions defined only on zero one um, to the L to the multilinear extensions. Um, okay, so here's, here's the picture you should have in mind for extension. So here's a function f defined on 0, 1, two, you know, two-dimensional 0, 1. Um, and here is its multilinear extension. So the multilinear extension is there's, there's a row for every field element and a column for every field element. So I, I, you know, I don't have an infinitely big slide. I, I cut it off. Um, 
so you can see the, the multilinear extension, right, it, it agrees with the original function on the top left corner, that is the Boolean hypercube. Um, but the multilinear extension has a much bigger domain. And there are other extensions of f as well. Um, so here's another extension of f. Um, so this is not multilinear because it has a quadratic term. Uh, but nonetheless, it agrees with f um, everywhere f is defined in this top left corner. So I think the way you should think about these low degree extensions um, is the following. They're like um, different amplifying encodings of, of f, right? And the sense, short zipple tells us that if two functions defined on the Boolean hypercube disagree in even a single location, then their low degree extensions have to disagree almost everywhere, right? Because their low degree extensions can't be the same since they disagree at, a, at an input. And two low degree polynomials disagree almost everywhere. Other questions about the notion of extensions? Yeah, it seems a little bit like a miracle for somebody like me seeing it for the first time. Can you give some intuition? Again, because the original, the F, mm -hmm. the only thing you constrain is that you know it's any mapping mm -hmm. from a subdomain of mm -hmm. zero, one to mm -hmm. the L. Mm -hmm. You can still express it as a such a linear in every uh, variable. Yeah, that. yeah. I mean, so so that fact is polynomial interpolation, I guess. Um, like you can take any function, you can fit a polynomial to it. And that's all that these are doing. But not a degree one. Right. So um, because the interpolating set here is just is very structured, is 0, 1 to the L, um, that ensures that uh, you can always fit a multilinear polynomial to it. And uh, right. But there are various reasons why we will not always want to use multilinear extensions. Um, but it's nice to know that you can fit a multilinear one. Sorry, I, I think the question I have on the previous slide is relevant here because I think the point is that your the, your degree oneness gives you like two to the n degrees of freedom. So the mm -hmm. point here is that you're trying to fit two to the n points, not that they're necessarily lined up in this cube. Like I claim some version of this is probably true if you just replace this with some other two to the n two, points. Right. So so it's definitely the so I'm not I. I'm not sure I know enough algebra to answer this precisely. I think the structure of the interpolating set does matter. Um, but all we're going to need for this talk is that if your interpolating set is 0, 1 to the L, then there always is a multilinear polynomial that interpolates over. So what is the domain of G? Is it F to the L? or F to the L. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so this picture uh, giving an, an evaluation of the extension, I'll move to the G one. For every um, input to G, um, there's a there's supposed to be a row for every uh, field element and a column for every field element because that's F F two. F to the two. Yeah, the domain of G is um, the field to the L. More questions. All right, great. Um, so it, when we actually use these low degree extensions in interactive proofs, the verifier naturally will sometimes have to evaluate the low degree extensions at, at an input. So it's important that that can be done quickly. So I just want to mention uh, one result, which is suppose we're given all 2 to the L evaluations of f, which is defined on 0, 1 to the L, as input. All right. Then there's an algorithm that can take uh, also as input, um, in addition to the evaluations, a, a random um, vector in FL, and in order 2 to the L time, okay, and that's a linear time if the input is actually specifying an evaluation um, for every, every entry of 0, 1 to the L, uh, 2 to the L time for evaluating the multilinear extension at that input. So here you're counting an arithmetic operation over F as unit cost? Throughout the whole talk, uh, arithmetic operations over the field addition or multiplication is one, one time step. And, and getting a similar version over constant size field relating with the profile experience question that's open? Or? I, that I just don't, I haven't thought about it. Yeah, I, I always count field operations on operation. I don't think about bit complexity. Okay, so let me just say that again. So if, if I gave you all 2 to the L evaluations of some function f as an input, and you wanted to evaluate the multilinear extension of f at a random input, you could do it in time order 2 to the L. 
Um, now, in, in this is different than interpolation, or can you tell us? Yeah, so, so using Lagrange interpolation, you would get an extra um, log factor here. So the runtime would be 2 to the L times L. Um, and Vu et al. Um, have a nice dynamic programming trick to save that log factor. Um, yeah, but if you just did Lagrange interpolation, you would, you would just have the extra. So in the bit model, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yeah, right, right. This might save you time even in the bit model, because in the bit model, you might have two log factors going to one. I don't know. <laughs> really don't want to talk about the bit model. Um, OK, so, so in some contexts, this order 2 to the L time like, won't be nice for us. So I did want to mention, and we'll see an example of this shortly, that if, if the function f has some nice structure to it, then sometimes um, there is a low degree extension, it might not be multilinear, that can be evaluated much faster than 2 to the L time. This slide might make more sense when we actually see the interactive proofs and realize, hey, the verifier needs to evaluate this polynomial quickly, and I tell you it can. Okay. All right, so we got through all of the dry technical preliminaries, and finally um, I can talk about what, what I consider uh, a, a real highlight, uh, the sum check protocol, which is due to Lund, Fortnow, Karloff, and Nissan. Um, and, and I want to stress that, in my view, this is, this is really the one hammer you need to know if you want to design an efficient interactive proof. So if you ever find yourself in need of an efficient interactive proof for some problem, the very first thing you should do is make sure you understand the sum check protocol and just try to apply it. And uh, uh, if, if all I convey in the next and the remaining however much time I have left is, is that fact, then I'll, I'll be satisfied. Um, OK, so let's uh, dive into the protocol. So. Um, on its face, if you've never seen it before, uh, it probably looks like it's solving some esoteric problem that can't possibly be very useful, but it turns out to be. Um, so we're going to think of uh, the input as follows, um, to, just to present the sum check protocol on its own. So think of the verifier in this protocol as given oracle access to an L variate polynomial G over a field F. So what this means is the verifier can go to the oracle and say, hey, Oracle, tell me the evaluation of G at this input. And the Oracle just comes back and says, here's the evaluation, the evaluation of G at that input. Um, so in, in real applications, there won't be any Oracle. That's some like idealized setting uh, that doesn't correspond to the real world. But to present the protocol itself, it's nice to think of the verifier as having this Oracle as the input. All right, so that's all the verifier can do, really, is, is go to the oracle and say, give me G's value at this input. And what the verifier wants to do is it wants to sum G's values at all 2 to the L Boolean inputs. That's the problem we're going to solve. Right. And again, I'm not sure, like, I wouldn't look at this having for the first time and think, oh, that's obviously a useful thing to do, but it turns out to be useful, so that's what we're going to do. Does this make sense? OK, so it turns out the sum check protocol can fit on really half a slide. Um, I'll take the whole slide. Uh, so here's how it works. At the start, the prover just sends the claimed answer. Right? So this, the, the verifier now needs to check, does this claimed answer C1 actually equal the true answer, which is this big sum? Yep. How you solve it by yourself first? Sure, OK. Um, so given that the, uh, so, so LAS, how, how can the verifier solve this problem herself? And all the verifier can do is actually ask the oracle two to the L questions. It can go to the oracle and say, hey, give me the value of G at input 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and just walk through every term of this giant sum and compute the answer herself. That obviously takes two to the L oracle queries, and in particular, at least two to the L time. And we're going to have the verifier run in much faster time than that uh, with the sum check protocol. OK, so at the start of the protocol, the prover just sent the claimed answer um, and nothing else. So the verifier needs to now check, is this claimed answer correct? So in the first round of the protocol, the prover sends a univariate polynomial, um, which I'll call S1, which is claimed to equal this thing. OK, so what is this thing? So this, this thing has just taken the true answer, this big sum, and it's lopped off the first sum, the sum over B1. The, the, sum, um, the sum over the first variable. And it's just left the first variable free. 
Does everyone see that? So the claimed answer is you know, summing g over all 2 to the l um, Boolean inputs. And this thing is doing something very similar, except it's leaving the first variable free and not summing over it at all. Now, was the size of this is a little bit bigger because you now determine x1. Oh, that's the size of s1 or the, the size of what the proof is. Let, let, just let's not worry about. Um, so, so, so s. Okay, right. So s1 itself um, is a univariate polynomial. Well, sorry. Let, this thing, which, the, which S1 is supposed to equal, is a univariate polynomial. How, what is its degree? Well, it's, a, its degree is at most the degree of G in variable 1, right? Because each one of these terms with the Bs fixed is just a univariate polynomial of degree at most, um, whatever the degree of G is in variable 1. So like in applications, you know, G might have degree 3 in each variable or something. I don't know. Uh, we'll see applications shortly. The point is. Uh, Whatever the degree of g is in each variable is going to be, it's going to be low, low degree. So s1 is just a low degree univariate point. Other questions? So let me give this thing a name. This is what s1 is supposed to be. I'm going to call it h1. And h1 is precisely defined so that the true answer equals h1 of 0 plus h1 of 1. Does everyone see that? So if you, if you plug in 0 uh, for x1, what you get out of the sum is exactly all of the terms for the true answer as where b1 is fixed to 0. And if you plug in 1 for x1, you get all the terms of the sum where b1 is fixed to 1. So this, this thing, h1, is like precisely defined. So the true answer is h1 is 0 plus h1 is 1. Everyone see that? Okay, so the verifier just checks that that holds for the claimed answer. Um, that is, does the claimed answer equal S1 of 0 plus S1 of 1? All right, so this check is like designed to pass so long as S1 actually equals H1. Okay. So at this point in the protocol, um, it's actually safe for the verifier to believe that the claimed answer is correct so long as the verifier actually believes that S1 and H1 are the same polynomial. Right? I mean, because if, um, if S1 actually equals H1, then I, I just said, like, the claimed answer equals the true answer, because the true answer is H1 is 0, that's H1 1. Does that make sense? Okay. So how can the um, verifier convince herself that S1 and H1 are the same polynomial? Well, this harks back to Reed-Solomon fingerprinting. Uh, you can just evaluate the two polynomials at a random point. If they agree at that point, so long as the verifier chose that point at random, then it's safe to believe they're the same point. So the entire rest of the protocol is just devoted to checking that S1 and H1 agree at this random point. Right. Yeah. So that's what these um, that's what these two bullets say. So V picks this random point R1. And the rest of the protocol is devoted to checking that S1 and H1 agree at that point. OK, now the problem with just, you know, the verifier can't just check this directly because the verifier doesn't know what H1 is. Right? H1 is defined by this big sum, which is almost as big as the, you know, original sum defining the original problem. The verifier can't just compute H1 of, of R1. Um, but fortunately, um, H1 of R1 has a nice form. Right? So, um, this right-hand side here is h1 of r1. Okay, so I just took h1 and plugged in r1 for x1. Okay. And this is exactly the kind of sum that the sum check protocol can compute. Right. And moreover, we've made some nice progress because now the polynomial we're summing over, it's, uh, it has one fewer variable. Okay. So the polynomial we're summing over now is g, but with the first variable fixed to r1. So we, that polynomial now has L minus 1 variables instead of L. OK, so that's the sum check protocol in half a slide. Right. So the, the prover sent S1, which was claimed to equal this thing. The verifier checked that um, this equality held. Uh, the verifier picked a random point R1, sent it to the prover. And then they just recurse to verify that this equality holds. And they can just keep, do, keep doing this, keep recursing. 
eventually you have to stop recursing. And there's a natural point to stop recursing, and that's um, in the final round, round, round L. Um, the, the thing that you would normally recurse on is to check that SL of RL equals G with all L of the variables bound. Right, so like each round of this protocol is binding another variable to another random value, and eventually all L of the variables get bound. And then at that point, there's no need to recurse because the verifier can compute G at, with all variables bound, just with one Oracle query. That's, that's what the Oracle does. <coughs> does the protocol make sense? Okay, so that's the protocol, and I hope I presented it in a way that kind of motivates why it works the way it does, you know, kind of as I was presenting it. But now we'll just analyze it. So even if you thought it was unmotivated, um, you'll see that it works whether, whether it's motivated or not. Okay, so let's start by uh, talking about completeness and soundness. Uh, so completeness holds by design. So th like the, the only checks that the verifier did in the whole protocol um, were, were checks of this form. You know, does uh, some claim value equal uh, a message evaluated at zero plus evaluated at one. And I kind of explained, you know, as I was describing the protocol, that those checks were designed specifically to pass if the prover's honest. Right, like, um, the claimed answer is, in fact, H1 of zero plus H1 of one. So if the verifier actually sends H1 in round one, the check will pass. So, that, so completeness holds with probability one. An honest prover will always convince the verifier to accept. So the, the interesting direction is soundness, which says if the prover doesn't send all of the prescribed messages, or at, at least, um, let me put it this way, um, if the prover doesn't send the, the true answer at the start of the um, protocol, then the verifier rejects with high probability. Um, so the soundness error uh, grows linearly with the degree of the polynomial G um, that you're summing over. Okay, so I'm actually going to run through the whole soundness proof. Um, it takes only about a slide and a half. And you can prove this by induction on the number of variables L. And that shouldn't be too surprising because each round of the sum check protocol, we were kind of binding another variable um, to a random value and thereby reducing the number of variables that later rounds had to sum over. So it kind of makes sense that you would analyze the protocol kind of variable by variable. So we're, indu we're doing induction over the number of variables here. So the base case um, is L equals one. Um, and in this case, the protocol is so simple as to be almost a, a triviality. If you're trying to sum up a one variant polynomial, um, and you, the, what, all the prover does um, in, the, in the protocol is send a single message S1, which is claimed to equal the input polynomial itself. So if you specialize the sum check protocol to the case where there's one variable, there's only one message from the prover, and that message is supposed to just be the input polynomial. And all the verifier does in that case is pick a random input and make sure with one Oracle query to the, to the true input polynomial G that the message and the input agree at that point. And we've already seen if, if S1 and G were not the same polynomial, then if you evaluate them both at a random point, you would get something different out with high probability. So in the, in the base case for the soundness analysis, it, it really just boils down to this fact that any two distinct polynomials are discrete at a randomly chosen point with high probability. Does that make sense? Have I lost anything? So the inductive case uh, works as follows. So now we're considering a, a general number L of variables where L is greater than one. And recall that the prover's first message, S1, is supposed to equal this polynomial, H1. Um, and the way that the verifier in the protocol checked that S1 and H1 actually were equal was to pick a random R1 and kind of recursively check that S1 of R1 equals H1 of R1. Right, and again, we can exploit this fact that if S1 does not equal H1, 
then with high probability over the choice of R1, they're going to disagree. Right, what I've written here is that they agree with low probability. Um, and the point is, if they do disagree, then the prover is left to prove a false claim in the recursive call. So that's the key insight here. That kind of reduces the um, general case to your inductive hypothesis. Because the recursive call is applying the sum check polynomial to an L minus 1 very polynomial, so we know by induction that the prover fails to convince the verifier in the recursive call of a false claim just by the inductive hypothesis, you know, uh, except with very small probability. So if you actually put all this together, what you conclude is that if the, if the first message S1 does not equal what it's supposed to equal, then the probability the verifier accepts is um, at most bounded by one of two things. So either the, the prover gets lucky in the first round and the verifier picks an R1 at which S1 and, and what it's supposed to equal agree, even though they don't agree as polynomials, or the, ver or the prover gets lucky in some later round. And, and he, this we bounded directly by our, our key fact that we've used over and over again in this talk. And this we've bounded just by the inductive hypothesis. Um, so there is no known, it's, it's almost certainly impossible to do this um, without interaction, um, unless things we totally believe are definitely false or turn out to be true. <laughs> I mean, you still have interaction, it's just that you have much less interaction. You have like constant rounds instead of rounds. So the proposal is to send... Like the first time you send R1, you just send all of them. Oh, I see. So just one round of interaction? Yeah, this, this, it was, so what it, it, it would not work. What, that proposal. It's very important in this analysis that when the prover sends um, any polynomial in any round, it has no idea what the next ri is going to be. So I'm trying to um, see what is the significance of having exactly uh, two points in each dimension and the points being zero and one. That seems completely arbitrary. I could do Correct. any interpolation. Any Correct. So the code is a secret that's interpolated. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so I, I, I introduced you know, the input domain being 0, 1, um, because that's what we'll need in applications and it keeps things concrete. Uh, but no, you can, you can do the sum um, over any set, uh, any, any like product set. So it's not important that 0, 1 to the L. It could be any H to the L for any set H. And it doesn't have to be 2. It could be Correct. And in particular, if I did that, you know, so in each dimension, one through L, mm -hmm. you have a, I don't know, D, I, degree mm -hmm. um, a polynomial. Mm -hmm. So if I summed or, or even took any uh, linear combination in that direction, mm -hmm. I could really compute any point value, right? I, I could really do uh, yeah. I no, all the information, right? Yeah, I think everything you're saying. Nowhere in the sum check protocol was it important that you know this set was zero, zero one uh, to the L. All, the, all that mattered was that G had low degree in each variable. Okay. Uh, but we'll see in all in all the applications um, for this talk, um, like zero one to the L is the domain you care about anyway. So this will make more sense later. It just makes things more concrete. Well, you need it to be small because otherwise you're summing up H to zero plus H to one, right? So. Yeah. Um, so what do you need to be small? The, like you're checking the, each individual the sum. sum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, three instead of two, but yeah. not. Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, ultimately. Um, yeah, that, that's right. But it could have been also just one, right? Uh, if so constant factor. Well, at that point, you could think you could you could collapse rounds out of the protocol if if you're, there's a variable you're not summing over, but as an optimization, but. Yeah, let's, let's just say the thing I can say concretely and for sure is that um, you can take any, any product set um, and as long as uh, the product set is uh, kind of small in each um, dimension, the assumption protocol will work and be efficient. Is there any essential uh, difference between this and uh, what they taught me some 35 years ago, IP equal P space? No, this will get you almost all the way to IP equals P space on its own. Um, and that's what's coming next. 
Yeah. So this is uh, the sum check protocol is like really the hammer that you want to do anything with interactive groups. Yeah, this is the core of my people's space. So yeah. I missed it. So what's the attack if you send all the R's? Um, so like imagine at round one that before the prover sends S1, it actually knew what R1 would be. Okay, then he could send an S1 that's not equal to what it should be. It's a different polynomial, but they just agree at R1. So this is where unpredictability of the verifier's messages is essential. Why their messages need to be randomized so they're not predictable. Um, so I think we're almost done with the sum check protocol. Uh, we now understand it's complete and sound. I'm just going to summarize its costs, and then I think it's time for the break, right? Okay. So um, if G had degree at most D in each variable, then in each round of the protocol, and there were L rounds, the prover was sending a degree D univariate polynomial. Okay, so the total communication is order D times L field elements. And moreover, when the verifier processes each message, um, like all it was doing, it's, uh, the verifier would take each message, uh, which is a degree D polynomial, and it would evaluate at 0 and 1 and sum the two, you know, and compare that to the preceding, um, to some value from a preceding round. So th what this means is the verifier can process each message. It's a very simple check. It's processing each message in linear time and the size of the message. Okay, so the verifier's runtime. Um, over all L rounds is just order D times L. Right? Uh, it's just processing each message in linear time and the size of the message. And at the very end of the protocol, the verifier has to you know, ask the oracle for the evaluation of G at one randomly chosen point. That's everything the verifier does. Right. Uh, the prover runtime, I don't want to get into um, it in great detail. but uh, So I'm just going to assert and hope you believe me that the runtime of the prover is, is pretty close to just the time required to solve the problem in the first place. Right? So to just solve the problem with no proof of correctness, uh, the problem was summing g at 2 to the l inputs. All right, so if the prover only has oracle access to g, it can only be done in time 2 to the l times 1 oracle access. And it turns out you can actually implement the prover in the sum check protocol in uh, just to factor d slower than that. I just want you to believe me. Um, so feel free to ask questions, but I think that's what I wanted to get through before the break. Pause here. Right? Okay. We do have five minutes if you want to ask uh, questions or we just have a break. So am I right to claim that the only time the fact that G is a polynomial is used is in the soundness and it's in the line that the probability that two things match up is uh, I think that's right. I mean, of course, the protocol is defined so that everything being transmitted from the prover to the verifier is a polynomial. Right. Um, but that's, that's the, the key. Being a polynomial is not. Oh, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th but you're right. I mean, that's the key. That's what everything boils down to is low degree polynomials. Um, because of this key fact that any two low degree polynomials that are not the same disagree at almost all inputs, um, that is key to the soundness analysis. That's what's giving the verifier all of this power over the prover to make sure the prover has to send exactly the right message in every round, or else the prover will get caught. So, right, so if you're supposed, because I, I assume the probability that two random functions with slightly different parameters will mismatch is actually pretty high, like just take random functions. So, what doesn't work there is once we do this conditioning, the resulting thing cannot be sent over in like a, in a fewer number of bits in a way of pumping with a thing. Is that right? <coughs> yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? OK, so I got through like the key hammer uh, that is unlocks all powerful interactive proofs. Uh, so we'll actually start applying this hammer after the break. Yeah. Okay.